So it's a great pleasure to join Drs. Thomas and Ferguson again to talk about this uh, extraordinary book, which I think I'm right in saying first published 350 years ago, there or thereabouts, um, 1678. Let's just have a show of hands. I'm guessing it's going to be probably most people, but hands up if you've read Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah, pretty overwhelming. Now, keep your hands up, if you would, if you think that it is amongst the best, let's say in the top three books you've ever read. Keep your hand up, please. Yeah, that's a pretty good percentage. Now, um, for those folks here who maybe have not read Pilgrim's Progress or have not read it for a little while, could you just give a very you know, brief pricey of you know, what, is, what is Pilgrim's Progress? What's the rough, rough outline? Well, uh, there are two parts. The first part is the story of how uh, the pilgrim who lives in the city of destruction realizes he needs to get out of the city of destruction and make his way to the heavenly city. And by God's grace, gets there through many dangerous toils and snares. Spoiler alert. There's a happy ending. Spoiler alert. Um, it's well, been it's, 350 it's, years. It's in the genre of a, of a road trip. It, it's, it's a journey from A to B. Uh, it's like Lord of the Rings. Um, so uh, the, lots of the great books um, that are memorable are, in fact, great journeys. And, and this is a, a phenomenal journey uh, from the city of destruction to uh, the heavenly city and all the things that happen in between. Can you remember when you were first introduced to it? Yes. So I was saved in uh, 1971. Uh, I was a freshman at, at college. That's a, an American way of, of describing. I was in my first year at university. And um, for my 21st birthday, <clears throat> uh, a friend that, that, that roomed with my wife-to-be uh, who apostatized later, uh, but she gave me a leather-bound copy of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, which I still have, but I didn't bring it with me because I couldn't find it, but it's in my library somewhere. And uh, I, that was the first time I'd read it. I'd, I had had allusions to it in an English literature class uh, in high school, but I'd, ne I'd never read the whole story. Dr. Ferguson? I can't remember. It, it was, I think, sometime at latest in my early teens when, when one was supposed to read all these improving books that you were really too young to appreciate, um, like Pride and Prejudice and uh, various other things. And there were, there were kind of slightly children's versions of them. So it went along with, and I actually think it probably had quite an influence on, not that, I, not that I really know anything about it, it went along with Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and uh, Swift's Gulliver's Travels as like the third book that recalcitrant Scottish schoolboys ought to read. And then... Uh, I, I cannot remember quite how this happened, but I bought a copy uh, when I was somewhere at the beginning of university and read it. And by that time, I'd been a Christian a few years, and I, I, I really could not believe it was such a great book. In fact, I became such, a, such an enthusiast, I started selling copies of Pilgrim's Progress to fellow students who were Christians. Um, and uh, I, I d <clears throat> since it wasn't in copyright, none of the Bunyan descendants got any money from my efforts. That's a very Scottish thing to do. <laughs> Glad you said that. <laughs> wow. Now, do you think then that you have to be a certain age to really appreciate the Pilgrim's Progress? Do you have to be, let me ask you this, do you have to be a Christian to appreciate Pilgrim's Progress? Uh, no, because... There have been at least three um, critical editions of Pilgrim's Progress published by Oxford University Press or Penguin or, or uh, in the latter half of the 20th century by 
Oxford or Cambridge scholars uh, renowned for their scholarship of, of Bunyan, and I doubt that any of them would be at a Ligonier conference, for sure. Um, I, I mean, there was a time in, in high school when, when Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress was an example of 17th century literature, but perhaps along with um, the Holy War, um, one of the very best examples of allegorical writings in all of English history, in, uh, yes, in all of English history. So, so there was an interest, and I think there remains an interest uh, in uh, Puritan literature among those who are maybe not even Christians, but it's a cracking good story. I, I don't think, if, you, if you're not a Christian, there are, <clears throat> there are subtleties about the nature of the Christian life and, and so on. Um, that you probably wouldn't get, you know, without a, a, a footnote edition saying this means X and this means Y. Yeah, when we were told to read it, there was no Christian motivation in getting us to read it. It was because it was a great classic. And when Derek was speaking there, I just remembered in, in the biography of Alexander Duff, who was a very great figure in early 19th century world mission in India. There is a story of a young couple in the, I think they were in their early teens, married, very young, by family arrangement, living in the family, and somehow or another they got hold of a copy of, they were in a Hindu family, got hold of a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, and in bed one night, one of them said to the other, we are living in the city of destruction and we need to flee. And they turned up at Alexander Duff's door. So its influence has been really remarkable. That's an, a real illustration of, um, it's not a matter of age, you know, that brings its spiritual benefit. Up until, I think, the middle of the 20th century, so 1950 or so, maybe, maybe even 1960, Next to the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress was the most printed Christian book in, in the English language. That's no longer the case, but, but for, um, for almost 300 years, it was right up there as the number one book to read, which only goes to show, um, I mean, sadly, if I asked what you did at the beginning to a class of seminary students, Less than 10% have read Pilgrim's Progress, and there is no way of going through the pearly gates without having read Pilgrim's <laughs> Progress. Yeah. I, this is interesting, Barry. I had a, a doctoral student from, I think it was Nigeria, he was from, and he said it was the single most important and influential book among Nigerian Christians in terms of the whole history of. Christianity in Nigeria. So it's, it's phenomenal, really, isn't it? Well, let's get into that a little bit more then, because the kind of impact that you've talked about, the, you know, the endless reprintings of it uh, around the world and so on, it can't just be because it's, it's, a, it's a good read. It clearly is. But what else do we, do we put this down to? I mean, J.I. Packer famously said, you know, you should, you know, every Christian should read this at least once a year. Um, do you, do you think he was overstating it a bit? And if not, why not? What is it about this book that means we well, ought to read? I, I need to think he was overstating it or feel guilty. He is cleansed and is absolutely righteous in this matter. He does, <laughs> I think he does read it uh, every year. Um, maybe, you know, since it's a storyline, maybe I can, some of the folks in the room definitely know the fact that Derek and I were colleagues at one time. And I had occasionally said to our congregation, you may be able to get to heaven without reading Pilgrim's Progress, but if I were you, I wouldn't take that chance, <laughs> which was less dogmatic than Derek's statement here. And then I knew that Derek had a real expertise, and so when we became colleagues, he did a series on Wednesday nights on Pilgrim's Progress. Um, and I sat there, I mean, I was just overwhelmed by 
how much He was teaching people without them realizing how much He was teaching them. And I, because I'd read Pilgrim's Progress, I'd never heard anyone kind of work through it as a text. I was absolutely amazed at how much there is in the, that you could, in a sense, you teach everything out of Pilgrim's Progress. It is that significant. And is that partly its power, do you think, that there's something about when, when C.S. Lewis talks about the power of fiction, he talks about the ability that fiction has to steal past the watchful dragons of people's critical faculties. So you can, as it were, get in under the radar with these kind of extraordinary grenades of truth. Um, I'm getting a very mixed up metaphor now, but you know, you, 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 that sort of idea, do you think that's partly why it, it had such a rich history? Yes, I mean, it, it's a very, very powerful story, and, and I think that Bunyan is a great storyteller. Um, he, he's a master at the use of allegory, um, and clearly, uh, it, it's a theological text, I mean, told in the form of a story. Now, the first, the first book, published in 1678, uh, was followed by another in 1684, part two of the story of, of Christian's wife, Christiana and the four boys. But the first book got into um, a lot of difficulty because in the narrative, Christian who has this burden on his back, you're, you're almost a third of the way through the book and he still hasn't lost this burden. He's gone through uh, the, the narrow gate, um, the, 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 the straight gate, the narrow gate, uh, and, and it's, it's, the question arises, why, why did Christian not lose his burden earlier? Spurgeon, who loved Pilgrim's Progress, his, his sermons are, are littered with, with illustrations from Pilgrim's Progress. Um, but even he found that aspect difficult, and he talks about whether this was true or not, but he tells a story in one of his sermons of going to uh, the fish market in London and meeting this fishwife who evidently had read Pilgrim's Progress, and she said to him uh, that if she were writing the book, she would have gotten Christian rid of that burden a whole lot sooner than Bunyan did. And that gave rise to a lot of criticism that Bunyan may have been inherently legalistic or, or uh, that, that he may have been suggesting that you have to pass through X, Y, and Z before you can you know, become a true Christian. And, and, and the simple answer is that this is a biography. He, he's describing his own personal way of coming to Jesus, which had a two or three year period when he was under conviction of sin. And... and I don't have that experience. I, I was under conviction of sin for maybe two hours, and I fell on, I fell on my knees and asked Jesus to save me. Um, but, but others clearly have struggled for a length of time uh, with the burden of sin before receiving assurance that their sins were forgiven. Yeah, that does seem to have a certain sort of psychological accuracy. I don't know whether that was your experience. Is yeah, I for reasons that are probably obvious, I probably had a more prolonged experience of conviction of sin. And it, the thing S about... Scottish again. When, <laughs> when, I think when that's true, even as a youngster, um, what Bunyan, the things Bunyan says, you know, you can kind of draw direct lines from the, the picturesque way, and he describes this, and the people who are involved, and their names, and what they say, and you can see, oh yeah, I, rec I recognize that happening in myself, uh, perhaps not nearly in as, as prolonged and as dramatic a way for Bunyan, because he had, I mean, he really went through a mill of experience. But it's the, the fact, I think, that whether your experience of conviction has been compressed or elongated, you can see the points of 
identification in which you recognize that while there, are, there is a diversity of the ways in which the Lord deals with us, there are some things that are in common for all of us. You know, it's an important book, I think, for Ligonier Ministries because Bunyan had a firm grasp of Luther's doctrine of justification. He had read Luther's commentary on Romans. And if, if, if there's anything about our seed that I, that I will always remember, it's his love of Luther's doctrine of justification. And Bunyan is as clear as a bell. And, and sometimes when I reread my annual reread of, of Pilgrim's Progress, I often think of R.C., that R.C. could have written that, and written it in almost exactly the same language as Bunyan wrote it. And, and the fact that that was true in the 17th century and in the 16th century for Luther, and it's true in the 21st century, there's something about um, an understanding of how the gospel works um, that I think is a great primer for a, for a young Christian as well as a middle-aged and older Christian to remind themselves of the central truth of, of justification by faith apart from the works of the law. So tremendous theological fidelity, but also it seems from a, a you know, literary point of view, he had the ability to capture the rhythms of you know, everyday people on the street. There's a sort of a, almost a Shakespearean ability to just capture um, that sort of vernacular, which seems to have survived remarkably well. And just the imagery, I mean, I fought till my sword did cleave to my hand. And when they were joined together, as if a sword grew out of my arm, and when the blood run through my fingers, then I fought with most courage. There's just a real sort of propulsive... And, and, and that's talking. I mean, you know, when you read some of the battle scenes in, in Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, I mean, that descriptive language. But Bunyan, I mean, Bunyan had seen uh, the Civil War. He, was, he had lied about his age. I don't think he was involved in any battle. He probably saw the result of those set-piece battles and, and the power of language. I mean, he made a great deal of the fact that he, he was uneducated, uh, that he hardly had, had had any education. He was, he was more educated than most of us in this room in, in terms of self-education. But... The, the power of description. I mean, some, some of the words and allusions are part of the English language today, like Vanity Fair or Doubting Castle. I mean, even the secular man in the street knows what those, me know, knows what those terms mean. I, I, I'm really interested in, in Derek's uh, uh, putting John Bunyan and R.C. in the same uh, paragraph there are some preachers who, who see the significance of what they observe or what has happened to them, and it comes out in large pictures in their preaching, and then there's the rest of us. Um, and if you belong to the rest of us, you shouldn't try to do that because you don't have it. It's not part of your gift. But one of the things for preachers, I think, that, that Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress does is it kind of says, if you read me every year, then I will come out in your preaching. And um, this is one area, apparently, where plagiarism is allowed <laughs> to say it's just like Bunyan says in Pilgrim's Progress. Um, and I think that's another... That's not the central use of the book, but I think it's such a, such a valuable book for us to read, but also for those of us who teach or preach to be able to use. So, I mean, I, I, I know a lot more about some of the other Puritans than I know about Bunyan, but one thing I know is that almost certainly one of the first people to read it was John Owen. And John Owen sometimes had Bunyan to preach. And intellectually, they were chalk and cheese. I mean, John, John Owen could no more have used, naturally used one of Bunyan's illustrations than he could have flown in the air. And it just strikes me that in the storyline of their relationship, you get a very good illustration of 
that even within the preaching ministry, there's a huge diversity of gifts, and that we can learn from the gifts that others have, and if they're long since dead, we can actually use the gifts that they bequeath to the church. And so, there are many layers of the usefulness of the book. There's a story, isn't there, Sinclair, that, that after the restoration of Charles II, after, after the Ten-Year Republic, um, Owen... That was before we had a queen. I, but, I noticed you referred to the queen this afternoon. I was touched, <laughs> deeply touched. So, uh, the, and there's an interesting story, which is not for here, as to how John Owen could be on the parliamentary side in the 1640s and on the royalist side in the 1660s. But, but that apart, when, when Charles II chastised him for saying something uh, kind about Bunyan, he said that he would give all of his learning away if he could preach one sermon like John Bunyan. And that was quite a statement from John Owen's point of view. Wow. Wow. Now, just before we finish, it would be remiss of me not to mention that not everybody even in the evangelical world, is quite as enthusiastic about the Pilgrim's Progress. Let me just uh, read this little um, critique from someone. Um, the Pilgrim's Progress is called an allegory. No, it isn't. A Christian man called Christian is literally helped out of the slough of despond by someone called help. And he literally goes through the wicket gate on the way to the celestial city which sits on Mount Zion. For me, the literalness of Pilgrim's Progress renders it pointless. There is no subtext. So what he says... That, that could only have been written by an Englishman and a, and a, very, and a very snobby one at that. <laughs> I think there's only one kind of Englishman and it is snobby, so... Yeah. So, uh, I think it's an interesting point. He was saying, if Bunyan were rewriting The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Bunyan wouldn't call the lion Aslan. He would call the lion Jesus. So, the question is, is it still an allegory if you're doing that? And does it matter? Yes, I, I, I think it's still an allegory, but it's not, it's not the finesse of Lord of the Rings. I mean, the Lord of the Rings is so subtle that you could argue that it is not an allegory at all, although Christians like to think it is, and lots of books have been written suggesting that it is, but Tolkien was not himself an advocate that th this, is, this is really Christianity that I'm talking about. Um, but, but, you know, I think Bunyan was writing to the common man uh, and his own peers as, in his mind, uneducated. So, so the fact that it's, that it's um, a, a fairly coarse uh, kind of allegory, for Bunyan, that meant that it was more useful as, as an evangelical tract. If you, if you go back to the old days um, when the, the allegorical method of interpretation was employed and regarded as legitimate, in the church. So, people would read, theologians would expound the parable of the prodigal son as an allegory. So, you had to find out where the far country was, what the fatted calf was, or if it was um, the Good Samaritan, where the two coins, the two sacraments, was the in the church, was the in all that kind of thing. And when you read those theologians, you discover there's massive disagreement about what all these things meant. When you read the allegory of the Pilgrim's Progress, you have no doubt whatsoever what these names mean, you know. And, and so, the idea that an allegory would have a kind of mystical key to it, I think, is the kind of thing that this author is driving at. And I think that would be to miss the point of Bunyan. He, he wasn't writing a crossword puzzle. He was, he was writing a book that the, the most ordinary Christian with little or no education would never be in doubt as to who help was 
and so on and so forth. Just very quickly before we finish, do you have particular moments from the book which keep more, maybe more than other moments, come to your mind that you're particularly fond of? Um, the battle scene uh, with Apollyon, I mean, the description of it is very, very graphic. And if, you, if you're not moved, as you would be by a movie battle scene, um, uh, then, then you're made of stone, I think. But, uh, I mean, that, that's, that's one thing that I like about it. Yeah, I, I have a favorite. This is not my favorite, but it may be the scene I have made most use of where the pilgrim feels there are blasphemies coming into his mind, and he doesn't know that there are the dark ones behind him. And I've had occasion in pastoral ministry to say to people as they've talked about themselves, would you just, just wait a minute? And I've gone to my books, pulled out my Pilgrim's Progress, and read that passage to them. I remember somebody saying about the value of Dr. Lloyd-Jones pastoral ministry, that people would leave sometimes having light on their situation. Not told, here are the three things you need to do, but just seeing the truth about their lives in a different way. And I have seen, I've actually seen that just by reading and seeing the lights go on in someone's life who has actually been oppressed by the devil and not realized what is really going on in their lives. That's not my favorite scene, though. And this wouldn't be my favorite scene, but it was the most shocking scene. The first time I read Pilgrim's Progress uh, in the summer uh, of 1974, uh, the very last paragraph, there's been this beautiful description of Christian and faithful crossing the river, and that, there were iffy moments in it, and then finally, uh, they have their certificates and they enter in uh, to the holy city. And then all of a sudden there's another one trying to cross the river and he comes up but he doesn't have his certificate and two angels come down and take him to the side of the mountain and there's a door that leads straight to hell. And I, I remember screaming out, no, this can't, it can't end like this. And, and, that, and that, was, that was the gospel nature of Bunyan that the last word was a word of warning that if you don't believe, there's a gate that leads to hell. I've sometimes used that last two or three lines as an exam question for seminary students, discuss, and it's really amazing <laughs> the discussions that there are. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Well, if you're one of the few people in the room who hasn't yet read it, I'm sure having listened to that, you'll want to rush out and buy it. We have loads of copies in the bookstore. Will you join me in thanking Drs. Thomas and Ferguson? Thank you.